over in vacuum. We have some operator. I'll call it. Uh, what do I call it? We have y zero, y spatial, n x zero, x spatial vacuum. Now, what I want to do is I want to use time translation invariance to shift both of these operators to t equals zero. Okay. So recall uh, in Minkowski space your time translation invariance operator, e to the i h t, phi of t, x. This is how you, sorry, this is how you translate an operator to the time origin, right? But now, recall we're in Euclidean space, so what we want to do, so Minkowski goes to Euclidean, means t goes to minus, I tau. So this becomes e to the h tau phi of zero e to the minus h tau. Okay, so then we time translate these operators and we get e h tau phi of zero y e to the minus h tau Ah, let me be a little more careful. This is, sorry, how, let's go back to my old division. Y zero. I did this when I was writing my notes too. I screwed up tau with x and y. This is our creation operator. Let me just try to remember to include the dagger. Three minus is the creation operator. Okay, so we're free without loss of generality, to always define the energies we compute as a difference from the vacuum energy. Okay, the vacuum energy being not be zero, but we can't tell, we can only compute relative energy differences. So we're free to set H zero to zero. So that means the Hamiltonian acting in the vacuum, this just turned into one, right? So we get a sum over N zero, uh, phi zero Y, and then we have E to the minus H, uh, sorry, H acts on this state, and we get En, the energy of the nth eigenstate of the QCD Hamiltonian, Y0 minus X0. So, then it's often useful to project onto momentum because we have translation invariance, so we want to project on a state of good momentum, momentum is a good quantum number. So if I call this C of, well first of all, I'm free to set X zero to zero as well, because just as you expect, this only depends on the difference between Y and X. So let me just call that tau. So C of tau, x, and y. So then, most often what we do is form a state of definite momentum, some final momentum, which is simply the Fourier transform. So we're going to sum over all y, e, e final, y. And let me call this z, y, n. I'll call this z dagger uh, x, n. And then we have e to the minus e, n, tau. So this is a mixed time momentum correlation function. This is the object it is most often computed on the lattice. We could also do a Fourier transform over x to project the initial state onto the same momentum. Notice, of course, if you 
didn't project x onto the same. Oh, right. This this object now also has to depend. So this Fourier transform, the only y dependence is into z and this sum. Everything else is independent of y. So we can call this z n p. So if I tried to project the source to some different momentum, uh, it would vanish because I've already projected myself onto a state E and with some specific momentum. So you do have to worry about, of course, if you have momentum in different directions, you have degenerate uh, states. Okay, ignoring those issues, if you try to project onto a different momentum, you'd have a different E, so the N would be different, and so this would exactly cancel. So you don't actually have to do the Fourier transform in X, which is good because if you try to do the Fourier transform of both X and Y numerically, this is volume more expensive, right? Because you need to sum over the entire volume of the source as well as the state. And that would then mean you'd have, say, in our example of 32 sites, your calculation would be 32 cubed times more expensive. Nobody wants that. So you just take advantage of the fact that you have Translation and variance, and therefore when it, momentum is a good quantum number, and construct this object. Okay. So, from here, for example, we can set p to zero. If we set p to zero, what do we get? We get c tau p equals zero x, this is just going to be sum over n, z, n, 0, z dagger, and x, e to the minus, I'll call it m, n, tau. So just to remind us, since we projected the zero momentum, we're now going to pick off the mass of the particle. And so in Euclidean space, without ever having to worry about wick rotating, you see from the two-point function, you can get the spectrum. <coughs> So this is the thing, in fact, we know how to do with lattice QCD better than any other thing is compute the spectrum. That's what we're the best at. And so here's your homework five. I believe I'm on five now. So uh, start with the Minkowski space prop, uh, correlation function. Minkowski space correlation function. Recall, we can write it this way. Do a Fourier transform, or sorry, do a wick rotation. P zero goes to I P0 Euclidean, and compare to this. So that's one, uh, that's a good exercise to do. All right, so now, How do we get the spectrum out? Well, what we can do is simply go to the long time limit. So as long as there is a gap between the ground state and the excited states, as you go to sufficiently long time, you'll just project right onto the ground state. Right? All the excited states will be exponentially damped. So if we take limit tau goes to infinity, theta of tau, zero, x, going to get. Z, zero, zero. Z dagger, zero, x. Remember, this is P, and this is x, so this is sort of a mixed spatial momentum uh, overlap thing, or I never actually wrote this down. So, Z, N, P is zero, Sum over y, p e to the i, p dot y, zero, y, zero. And you 
have a similar equation for the dagger system with the source overlapping from the vacuum onto the state N. So these are these objects, these overlap factors. So if you take the long time moment of this correlation function, what do you get? Well, just looking at the expression here, you can see exactly what's going to come out. Right? You go to the long time limit, you get the zero n equals zero state, e to the minus n zero t, I'll call it, one plus delta z one zero z dagger one x delta e to the minus delta m one zero tau plus higher order terms where m one zero delta m one zero is just m one minus m zero. So the ground state is very easy to compute. You just calculate your two-point correlation function, go to the long time limit, fit an exponential to your correlator, and out comes the mass. If you want excited states, you can see life becomes harder because you're now going to try to be doing multi-exponential fits. If you know anything about data analysis, you'll know multi-exponential fits, trying to fit them is an ill-posed problem in the sense that it just, your standard solution of trying to just give a minimizer an arbitrary number of exponentials is not uh, one that minimizers know how to handle very well. So you have to come up with better uh, methods to try to solve these things. One thing you can do is you can come up with a, a bunch of operators. So, okay, before I get into that. So you'll notice what we do, we put down an operator and it produced a tower of energy states, right? And that's because it's a quantum field theory. All you can do is put down an operator with a set of quantum numbers. It will produce from the vacuum every single eigenstate of QCD with those quantum numbers. But that operator you put down, of course, is not unique. You can put down lots of different operators. So you can form the matrix of correlation functions. These are again these overlap factors, except you use different <coughs> operators, or we, we call them interpolating fields, to couple onto the states of QCD. And so then, if you come up with a good basis of different interpolating fields, you can then take this matrix of correlation functions and find ways to diagonalize it in a very variational method. You just apply the variational method to diagonalize this matrix, and in that way, you can actually access some of the excited states because you can come up with a linear combination of operators that maps onto the ground state very nicely. You can come up with a different linear combination that's orthogonal to the ground state. So it won't be polluted. If you want to extract an excited state, it won't be polluted by the ground state. So there's a very, uh, there's a huge amount of technology that goes into this. If you're interested, you can uh, look at the literature. You can email me and I can tell you where to look if you want. I'm not going to talk about it more. I just want to drive home. Again, spectroscopy is something we know how to do better than anything else for planets QCD. All right, so any questions about that? So let's talk about three point functions a little since my title said I talk about matrix. Variational approach can handle nearly degenerate eigenstates as well. So you can have states in the spectrum which whose masses are very similar, as you know by looking at the PDG. But if you construct operators that are orthogonal and coupled to those states differently, you can still project onto the different states. So if I was to think about the, the example you were talking about, pi pi dagger. Uh, well, I haven't written anything interesting yet. So, in QCD, uh, so 
if you want to construct the proton. The first interpolator you might think about using. This is an interpolating operator. This is an interp this is an interpolating operator that couples this is this couples to the ground state proton better than any other operator we know of. Right? There's other operators that you can use where instead of using the C gamma phi, you so this you know this goes back to the quark model. This is a dichord. And this we call the spectator quark. So maybe you want to couple to the roper instead of the nuclear. So then what you might do is have these quarks, the dichord, exist at x, and the spectator quark exists at x plus r, and try to build in some radial distance between the two. Uh, so then you form a linear combination of these two to remove that radial excitation mode from the nucleon, and then a different orthogonal combination will couple to the roper, for example. But the minute you start displacing quarks, your life becomes much more expensive as well. OK, three point functions. So I'm not going to say very much about these at all, uh, other than you can do them. I, I've mentioned a few times you can't compute scattering directly on the lattice. I wanted to clarify what I mean is you can't compute scattering of multiple hadrons easily on the lattice. Because I was saying, I also talked about, oh, you can compute deep and elastic scattering of nuclear on the lattice. So I, the scattering, of course, word is tied to both of those processes. But one of them, you have multiple hadrons interacting, and that's hard. We know how to do two hadrons. A paper came out yesterday in the archive to do three hadrons. Uh, beyond that, there's no rigorous mapping between the energy states of four particles in a box and infinite volume Minkowski space scattering information. So if you're a person who finds yourself very formally inclined, you happen to think this numerical stuff is interesting, you can try to think about how would I map four strongly interacting particles in a box into the infinite volume energy spectrum you would see. So that's something you can do without a computer. Well, I actually probably need a computer for that because you need to worry about solving the four-body problem, which involves integral equations, which involve lots of numeric work. But you don't need a big computer. You can get away with your laptop. OK. So we can compute, for example, photon nuclear scattering. How do we do that? Well, we know the electromagnetic current uh, okay so here this quark is a quark of flavor u v or s we have the vector current we need our charge operator and then a quark so q you can represent as this matrix More securely. Okay. So here's our electromagnetic current for energies less than the charm quark mass. So if you want to talk about stuff up to the charm quark level, then you have to worry about putting in a dynamical charm quark as well. I'm just going to assume we're below that energy scale. Okay. So then what do you do? You compute the matrix element between a nucleon of some momentum, I'll just call it P, F, or final. You insert this electromagnetic current, some momentum Q, and it's created off of some nucleon of momentum P. And of course, we can put spins into this equation as well. Uh, and you want Q of course, to be 
P final minus P initial. <coughs> now, we can't compute arbitrary momentum. Recall, I said we use periodic boundary conditions. And what does that mean? That means all of these P's, PI, PF, and Q, they all have to exist in 2 pi over L N. So you can see your ability to resolve the structure of a hadron is limited by the size of your box. If you want low momentum, you need a big box. Big boxes become more expensive, as we saw yesterday. It scales pretty poorly with the volume. Or you can try to come up with tricks where you give the quarks funny boundary conditions to give them a little extra kick to momentum as they wrap around the boundary. Uh, there's lots of things you can do. So this is what we want. This is the physical matrix I want we're interested in, right? And this describes a photon coming in, striking a proton. So here's my, my nucleon or proton save momentum P. I, and out comes the proton with momentum PF. And then on the lattice, what do you do? You take the vacuum, so this is so I have to sum over X final. I have to sum over an X operator. I'll write down what those are. Oops, I already didn't write up the P to the I, P final, X final, E to the I, Q dot to X operator of vacuum. Say, you can take this interpolating field. It's going to be spin alpha. I guess I'll erase this so it's not quite leading into the equation. So this is x final. And then we have our electromagnetic current. Q bar, gamma mu. You have the sum over all up, down, and strange quarks. Gamma mu, charge operator, Q. All this is it. Right. Sorry. This is it time final as well. This is at the time of the operator insertion, x of the operator insertion. And then we need to create the nuclear out of the vacuum. And this all happens at time zero, we'll just call it zero, and some initial x. So this is the object you have to compute. Uh, and you can see life, there's, there's many complications that go into this. First of all, you put down some interpolating field. It's an arbitrary interpolating field. You don't know how this operator actually couples onto the proton. So you have to divide out the overlap factor. Remember, what you're going to do is insert a complete set of states like we did in the two-point function. Here and here, and then you have to take ratios where you divide by the two-point function to exactly subtract the contribution from the interpolating field to the state. You have to cancel that away on the source and the state. So what you're going to do is you're going to divide by the square root. So you're going to have your two-point function. Uh, I'll just write it as C two point. So you want to take the square root because maybe your sink operator and your source operator are different. So you take the square root to cancel the arbitrary Z factor that comes in here. And then you have to divide by another two point function, the source. But you're still not done because this is gamma mu for the electromagnetic current. The electromagnetic current is, the renormalization is constrained because it's the electromagnetic current, so there's a warded entity that protects 
that current from receiving some arbitrary renormalization. But maybe you want to compute something else like the axial current, GA. Or you want to compute some other interesting structures in here. These quark fields are not equal to the physical quark fields, right? So you have to figure out, it is known what to do to renormalize this entire calculation using lattice regulator and compare that to MS bar. But there's a huge technology that goes into that. And again, I don't have time to talk about it. But that's how you make connection with what the other lectures have been talking about. So I, I didn't get there. I only had a few days. Uh, what else? What else makes this hard? So we can examine this calculation diagrammatically. So again, I'm just looking at this three-point function here. So what do we have? We have two possibilities. One, the quarks and the proton go through uh, and don't directly couple to this electromagnetic current. So maybe this current comes in and it looks like this. This is just a graphical way to mean when you do the Wick contractions and you tie these quarks up in all possible ways, one of the contractions is this. So this is your Q bar giving you Q insertion for this example. What you want to keep in mind is, of course, these quark propagators are dressed by all sorts of gluons, including gluons that tie them together. So this is how you can impart momentum through that operator. So this goes under the name of a disconnected And then you have to add to that the connected version. Which looks like this graphically. Well, that's one way you can draw it. The connected piece. And of course, you have to worry about, remember, you have like to say up, up, down for the proton. You have to worry about this up going into this one. So you have to include all possible contractions. So you have to be careful and make sure to tie up all. Basically, you apply Wick's theorem numerically and make all possible contractions you would on pen and paper. The disconnected diagrams tend to be an order or two in magnitude more expensive than the connected diagrams. They also happen to be noisier. So, especially when you want to put in up or down quarks. So these have been a big sort of source block for lattice species of people for a long time. Um, they're NC squared suppressed, so you don't expect them to be large. And rigor, so people until a few years ago have just entirely ignored these contributions. Now, uh, rigorously, you're allowed to ignore that if you want to compute an isovector quantity. So say you want to compute something in a proton minus the neutron. If you're in the isospin limit, then these C quark corrections exactly cancel between the proton and the neutron. But of course, the real world, not everything you want to know is isovector. Sometimes you're in the proton and neutron independently. But fortunately, again, uh, GPUs, so video games, have driven the technology to allow this calculation to happen with some reasonable amount of computing power. two-point function that looks just like this. For the proton. So what you so the point is when you construct this, there's some Z dagger onto the state N at X. And that is exactly the same thing you get here. And then there's some...